you know that the bikini was made by a French engineer by the name of Louis Riad, and he named the bikini after Bikini Atoll, which was an island that was used during Operation Crossroads by the United States as a nuclear testing ground. So he named it Bikini because he thought that the design would have a similar explosive reaction on the public. Hmm. Although if it was really true, it would just vaporize everyone for like a mile around. Now that's a hot bod. <laughs> Is this who could know hey and welcome back <laughs> it's me hey and welcome back to another episode of because science footnotes the show where I like to extend the nerdy conversation around everything that we get up to on because science the enterprise oh I kind of like that the because science enterprise boldly going where many nerds have gone before but not I have not on this show, I take your comments and questions and corrections and feature them to see who's going to be a super nerd, what I got wrong, etc., etc. It's like bringing comment sections to life, except they're not horrible monsters. On the last episode of Because Science, we tackled the trope of Superman crushing coal into diamond. I said that because coal is formed from dead animal and plant matter, and because diamonds preceded plants, in the age of their formation, that diamonds couldn't come from coal. In fact, most naturally do not and cannot. And I said that there's too many impurities in a lump of coal, so Superman wouldn't be able to create a nice shiny bling in his hand in the way you see in comic books and movies and television shows. I did say, though, that he could take graphite and crush that into diamond because we do that in synthetic diamond creation processes. So we need to update that trope. But what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from Steven Detweiler, who says graphite is possibly formed from the metamorphism of coal. Thus, if Superman was able to take a whole lot of coal and was able to create metamorphic conditions, it could be turned into diamond. This does add an extra step, but it's a way for Superman to turn coal into diamond, signed your friendly neighborhood geologist. Well, Steven, that's a good comment. I think you are correct. Well, you are correct, technically the best kind of correct. This is a way to make diamond from coal by first purifying the coal so that it is pure carbon, like graphite is. But if you're adding this extra step, I think you're getting a little too far away from the trope. It's easy to say if Superman had pure carbon, he could make something else with his powers that's also pure carbon, but that's not really what I think this common belief is about. It is taking a lump of coal like you could find sitting on the ground and just <laughs> diamond. And in that case, I don't think it's quite possible. Sure, if he could be a living laboratory, like I said, and refine coal down to its purest form of carbon, then sure, he could do different stuff with it. That's not exactly what we're talking about. But that's a really good point. I didn't even think about that process, turning coal into graphite, and that's how it happens. Look, we all got smarter, especially you. I'm not that smart to begin with. Oh, don't say that. Don't say that. You're smart about production. Look at this. It's just you. You did nothing, you do nothing. <laughs> I do, I do point too much. My mom doesn't like it. Our second comment comes from Kristen Schick, heir to the Schick Razor Fortune, who says, he must be, who says, how could he crush graphite Superman while using heat vision without burning his own hands off? And then a lot of other questions, and then just saying, uh, hey, I love the show. Would you ever consult for a Hollywood film? Ooh. Well, if you look at this old cartoon from the 1940s that I remember for some reason, you can see Superman becoming a transistor, holding on to two electrical wires and letting electrical current flow through him. Resistors, when they do this in electronics, they heat up a lot because the flow of electrons will heat up uh, the material as it moves through them. So if Superman can deal with the temperatures would have, that would be associated with that kind of feat, I think he has some superhuman heat tolerance too. I think he also like lived inside the sun at some point, so I think he can handle a little, uh, a few thousand degrees. Uh, also, 
Yeah, I would love to consult for a big Hollywood film, but uh, the people who normally do that are usually involved in science uh, institutionally, usually PhDs. Um, I know a few of them, and here in Los Angeles, there's an organization called the Science and Entertainment Exchange that loans out scientists to big movies, especially superhero movies, to hope uh, that they get their science right. Uh, one of my good buddies helped with the quantum physics in Ant-Man. I would love to do that stuff, but I don't have the education and I'm not smart enough. But I would though. You're, you're smart, you're a smart boy. Not smart enough. I'd be smart enough to know not to use Parsec if I'm talking about time. I'll say that. Our next comment comes from Mr. Shaw. This is the third time I feature you, buddy. Nice comments. Um, who says Superman is not theoretically invincible, he's just denser. Sure. Uh, so the amount of pressure required to form diamond should be more than the tensile strength of Superman's palm, so the graphite would impale into his palms before turning into diamond. Yes, good comment. Harkening back to the last episode about super strength, if Superman didn't have some kind of invulnerability to his skin, then the amount of pressure that we are talking about here, gigapascals of pressure, which would be more than putting a car or an elephant, or 10 elephants, yep, on this pen and putting it on my hand, that graphite that I'm saying Superman could squeeze into diamond would go right into his hand. And then do you know what would, what, you know what would happen? You get this, you get a little dot of graphite in your hand that never goes away. Then you'd be me, and nobody wants that. Our next comment comes from Theodore Minnick, who says, now the human body contains about 18% carbon. Yeah. That's almost 15 kilograms. Yeah. If you took all that carbon and crushed it into a diamond, it would be 74,000 carats. If, for example, your ex-girlfriend had super strength and heat vision, mm -hmm. she, would crush your, she could crush your heart into a 1,200 carat diamond. Bad breakup, buddy. It's okay. It gets better, on average, most of the time. Hey, so assuming a direct conversion of carbon to diamond, which might not happen, if one carat for a diamond is about 0.2 grams, then your numbers check out. Also, the human body turned into diamond, or what could be turned into diamond, would be worth $321 million. And your crushed by your ex-girlfriend heart would be about $6.2 million. So turn that frown upside into money. That's the phrase, right? Yep. Turn that frown, turn your personal misery into cash. What do you think I'm doing here? Our next comment, <laughs> I just read the name. Our next comment comes from Alexander Reinfield and Butt Butt, <laughs> who both say the same thing. You still have pencil lead in your hand, Kyle? Huh, I too, Butt Butt says, I, was, I too was stabbed by a pencil and have a spot of graphite in my thumb. Why hasn't it disappeared after seven years? Well, first of all, pencil lead is graphite, but it's not pure graphite as we'll get to. Butt Butt, I don't think the carbon is going away because it is just too big of a piece. I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I snapped off a whole tip of a pencil in here and also in my thigh. I'm not gonna show you that. But it's too big for the cells that get rid of cellular damage and other particulate in your body. It's too big for those cells and the mechanisms that do that inside your body to move away. That's why tattoos uh, fade very slowly, if at all, because there's actually particles of metal underneath your skin and those are too big for your body to transport away. Now, you could remove this piece of graphite with something like laser removal, where you could, uh, shoot tiny laser pulses at it to heat up one side differentially so quickly that it would shatter. And that's what happens in laser tattoo removal. And then it would be small enough for your body to take away and then you would eventually poop it out. You could poop a pencil in a roundabout sort of way. Don't eat a pencil and poop it. But if you have to get stabbed, poop that wound. Our next comment comes from Jonathan Socrates. Someone went to college. I don't know. If Superman could actually turn graphite into diamond, Mr. Socrates says, yeah. <laughs> turn graphite into diamond or carbon to diamond, as what Steven Detweiler stated, whoa, synergy. Would all the graphite turn to diamond in terms of mass or would there be a loss? 
Also, if you bought all the, no, I'm not gonna let you get into Lex Luthor economic damage and stuff. So, in what I'm describing, using pressure, pressure and temperature to alter the structure of graphite into diamond, this is a process that we use to create synthetic diamonds called high pressure, high temperature, or HPHT. This is a delicate process, even though it involves huge machinery and huge pressures and huge temperatures. If these temperatures, so you take something that looks like this, it's kind of like a core of graphite, and you have a seed diamond at the bottom, and then you, pl and this is not pure graphite, it's graphite mixed with a catalyst, some other metal, and you put this into a device, and the, the big uh, pressy bits come on the side, and they start applying pressure, and the whole apparatus starts applying temperature, and this material then gets so hot and so compressed that it starts to melt. And then because of the temperature difference that exists in this, the carbon atoms melt and then they make their way towards a more stable version of itself, which happens to be the diamond at the bottom. It starts creating little, little tiny diamonds. But if you don't control this process uh, very delicately, you can shoot past the temperature and pressure that you want. So diamond, sometimes in these, can actually transform, it can go from graphite to diamond and then back to graphite if it gets too hot. So there can be a mass loss when you're trying to make diamonds from graphite. Superman would have to be very careful. He seems like a delicate guy. I mean, he has to manage such a crazy alter ego. <laughs> Science, more like borance. Our last comment comes from Alexander R, who says, I can't, I can't figure out how to pronounce your last name, who says, me and my five-year-old daughter love watching your show. Even though she doesn't understand what's going on, she's always asking stuff, like why we don't float away like helium balloons. First of all, thank you so much for watching, and uh, hey, little one, do you know why we don't float away like helium balloons? Why I don't just oop, float away? It's because human bodies are very heavy. Air is very light. Now, even though there's air all around us, it's too light to press upwards on our bodies very much. We're heavy things, and so it can't lift us away and float into the sky like helium balloons. But I like the way you're thinking. Keep asking questions. Ask your dad, Alexander, as many questions as possible all the time. <laughs> you heard that from me. A lot of great comments this week. I can't get to them all, but I love seeing them pour in as we publish videos. But uh, the super nerd this week is Theodore Minnick. <laughs> Great job. You did the kind of calculation that I would do, trying to figure out how many carrots of person you could make if you took someone's body and squished it. I appreciate that kind of tenacity. Good jobby. But of course, it's not just comments. Sometimes I get things wrong. I'm not always right. It took me about an hour to figure out how time travel and Samurai Jack worked. It's fairly explicit. What did I get wrong this week? The first correction comes from Hazimina and Bob Wright, who both have a comment saying that pencils are not pure graphite. They're actually some, the most graphite in pencils can be up to like 90% and then the rest is clay and resin and some other things. Now in the episode, I said Superman could transform a pile of graphite into diamond, implying pure carbon, but then I also showed a pile of pencils to rep represent that graphite. So I totally understand if it seems like I said you can directly transform pencil graphite into diamond, and that's not the case because you'd have the same problem as you have with coal, impurities, and you wouldn't get a very good diamond or really a diamond at all as we would consider it. So, good correction. I even found a scientist who works with high pressure, high temperature uh, diamond synthesis, and he says that pencil lead, like a pencil rod, doesn't form diamonds. So you're absolutely right, good correction. Our next correction comes from Strangely Amusing, who says, I have a rebuttal based on the definition of a diamond, and he or she goes on to say, what about nano diamonds? Now, I didn't mention nano diamonds or diamonds smaller than you can see, really, because I don't really think it fits with the trope. 
You, you can create nano diamonds in other ways that would be totally available to Superman. He could cause an explosion that would create diamonds. He could punch the ground so hard, it would be as hard as a meteorite impact and it would probably form nanoscale diamonds. But because what we see in movies and comic books is the crushing of a lump of something into something that would be worth a pretty penny, I didn't include nano diamonds, but it is important to point out because they are still diamonds. It's the same structure. Good point. Our next correction comes from a few people, uh, Horrier and Jayberg, who say versions of diamonds aren't rare. It's a conspiracy by companies who will remain nameless uh, to artificially create the cost of diamonds. And you're right. Diamonds are kind of like some rare earth metals that aren't geologically or chemically rare, they are economically rare. They are forced into valuability because we consider them valuable and supply and demand can change their cost as we buy them. So I did say in the episode, we consider diamonds rare and we do because that gives the impression of cost and scarcity and that's what drives cost, but you're absolutely right. There is something more to the cost of diamonds than their rarity. In fact, it has a lot more to do with economics. Illuminati confirmed. Our next correction comes from Ty Rage's Fantasy World, who says, hey Kyle, I have one tiny issue with what you stated about Superman being able to make diamond from graphite. It's nothing big per se, but wouldn't the application of pressure also start increasing the temperature of the item. So would he really need to also apply heat vision or his heat powers to the diamond in this high pressure, high temperature situation that we're talking about in between his hands? Yes, yes he would. When we create synthetic diamonds in high pressure, high temperature environments, like we could do between Superman's hands, temperature has to be finely controlled, like I said previously, or else you can create diamonds from graphite and then they would degrade back into graphite. Look at this guy who is applying a torch to some synthetic diamonds that are turning back into graphite-like structures. And you can tell by the color change there. So. Yes, you cannot just apply pressure to these diamonds to create them, and temperature also has to be a part of the equation. Inside of the high pressure, high temperature apparatus, all that carbon in graphite mixed with a catalyst that's some other metal, all that has to melt as well. So the carbon atoms are free to travel down to the seed diamond and start crystallizing, creating other diamonds off of that seed. So temperature needs to be a part of the equation. So heat vision is still needed. Okay, glasses for dramatic effect. Our last correction comes from Jonathan Bronico, who says, hey Kyle, love the show, but I'd like to respectfully point out that cyanide drawn without a counter ion should be negatively charged with a lone pair of electrons on the carbon atom. It's a minor thing for a show like this, but for many organic chemistry students over the years, they make similar mistakes. I think it's important for me to chime in on this in the spirit of encouraging people to think more critically about seemingly minor details. Oh my science, you're absolutely right. <laughs> when I drew a cyanide, um, I drew it just with a carbon atom, three bonds for three pairs of electrons, and then a nitrogen atom. But because carbon can form four bonds like this, there's still a pair of electrons that are hanging around somewhere, meaning an overall negative charge because electrons are negatively charged, which means I didn't draw it technically correct, and if I was an organic chemistry student, apparently, I would get points taken off of that description. So, good correction. I feel like I'm back in school. A lot of good corrections this week, but I'm giving this week's best correction to, uh, strangely amusing. Congratulations, you are a super nerd. Be proud. I like what you said. Superman could create nano diamonds much more easily. And you also said, which I didn't read, while it's not as macho as just squeezing a lump of coal, imagining Superman in a lab coat using his heat vision on a flask is much cooler to me. I like where your head's at. Good correction. Now, if you are subscribed to Alpha at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be because you have already seen it. But if you haven't subscribed yet for premium sea tent, as I call it. Maybe I shouldn't call it that anymore. This week's episode of Because Science is gonna be... Uh, uh. Shh. More. Shh. Oh! Star Wars!
because that's right. On this week's episode of Because Science, we're going back to Star Wars, more specifically, The Last Jedi. Can science solve some of the biggest plot holes in The Last Jedi that you have sent to me that have to deal with scientific accuracy? They all have to do with events that occurred in space in that film, and I know it's gonna be very controversial because it's a controversial film, but uh, I think it's gonna turn out really well. There's, no, there's none of that, though. I kind of like it as background lighting, though. Oh, and also those plot holes aren't plot holes because the story still works even with or without that information. But we're covering them anyway! So go watch the last episode of Because Science if you haven't yet about Superman and Diamonds and leave me your comments, questions, and corrections because I will be checking all of these places. YouTube.com slash Because Science, Facebook.com slash Because Science, and at Because Science on Instagram and Twitter. And make sure to get in early because for this show, I have to check only the first few hours worth of comments. I do try to read them all, but not all of them will be chosen. And don't forget, we are this crude matter, Yoda. And that's amazing. We are a collection of atoms that can think and feel and love and matter to other hunks of matter. And all we are is the stuff of the universe. Nothing magical, nothing luminous. That's incredible. I think it's better. I think, oh wait. <laughs> Better, I think it is. <laughs> More accurate, is it? When 900,000 subscribers you are, not so big, you will think, hmm? I'm losing my mind. Bye.